Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Srileka Pali, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this Conversations That Count is to bring in guests that can address challenges facing our communities, provide solutions, and inspire change. It's also very important for Fairfax GOP to reach out to members at large, engage our immigrant and minority community members within Fairfax County and the Commonwealth. If you would like us to bring in guests that supports constitution, democracy, freedom, entrepreneurship, innovation, fiscal responsibility, and rule of law, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat. In honor of Black History Month, I am honored to invite Miss Vivian Childs. Miss Childs, served as chairman of the Georgia Black Republican Council and as the director on the National Diversity Co Coalition for Trump. Ms. Child served as middle Georgia Republican women, charter president, as Georgia Federation of Republican Women Parliamentarian and Rules Chair, served on the National Federation of Republican Diversity Committee Chair. Ms. Childs is a results-driven leader who has shown leadership on local, state, and national levels. Ms. Um, Childs, I am utterly honored to have you. You are my distinguished guest for today. How are you doing? I am doing great. And thank you for the honor of being chosen to be here today with you. Ms. Childs, your bio is quite extensive <laughs> and you're very accomplished woman. I would like to initiate these conversations by asking a question about your personal success. You're a minister, so today Sunday is a special day for you. Yes three accomplished children. I'm a mom myself. Uh, uh, and one of the one of your child is a medical doctor and attorney and a school principal with all of them having doctorate degrees. Tell me something. I mean, as a, a parent, I'm interested in knowing what values did you instill in them that made them so successful in their lives? Oh, I love to talk about my children, I tell you. And you're right, they are all very accomplished in their own way. Um, and interesting enough, the one that is that I have listed as the school principal is actually now she received a promotion and she is now the director of student services for Newton County Schools. Congratulations. So, yeah, so she's moved up a little bit higher this time around. But you know what? I was brought up in a family where nothing was impossible. As long as you had the Lord and you had a good family life, and you did those things that would take you to that next level. Uh, I, I tell the story oftentimes of my father who told us to look up into the sky and see all the stars and the unlimited possibilities that that offered. And so I taught that same thing to my children and that is why they are where they are today. Excellent. Ms. Uh, Ms. Charles, that is pretty impressive. I was reading your bio and I could probably just read your bio for two, uh, two three minutes at the scratch. But let's, let me kind of walk you through. As you know, this is a Black History Month mm -hmm. and I actually belong to a club where my president is a um, African-American woman. I'm, I'm uh, kind of thrilled to have the diversity in our party. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, as an immigrant, I'm always kind of curious as much as I read about uh, our history, uh, I also like to hear from leaders such as you. So Black History Month is a great time for us to discuss the accomplishments of our uh, African-Americans in the United States and to honor the struggles too and obst obstacles that this African-American race has had to overcome throughout US history. But I guess my question where I'm very um, uh, kind of perplexed uh, uh, is, is Black history in America different from the traditional history of American history? Or is Black history the American history? Black history, the way it was brought up is, it was an opportunity because, you know, as we know, we were not getting all of the recognition that we should have been getting in our curriculum in our schools. So to set this, set this month aside, even though it's only a month, because, you know, we function throughout the entire year, but at least it gives an opportunity for us to reflect on all of the challenges that have gone through, as we call it black history, but the remarkable accomplishments that have been made by black Americans. It was interesting that you mentioned this question because this morning in my sermon, it was called, um, who's at fault? Whose fault is it when something doesn't happen? And I gave it like a little black history lesson on 
what would life be like if there was no black people? And so I started naming some of all of the inventions that has been made by, by black people from the lawnmower to the air conditioner, to the refrigerator, all of those things that people may not have an opportunity to know unless we share that. And I know it's a month, I teach black history all year long because when I look in the mirror every morning, that's who I see. But at least we have that month to celebrate and that is what we're doing. Absolutely, Ms. Charles. We also have Asian American month, uh, uh, Hispanic American month. Mm -hmm. I think it's great to know. Just in black history month, we had uh, in my uh, women's club, we've had a council member come through uh, that spoke very well about Black History Month, and we've had uh, another past school uh, uh, school board candidate talk about Martin Luther King. It's just the more I learn, the more I'm interested in learning. I oh, mean, yeah. the, the amazing obstacles that race had to go through, but in spite of all of the all of that, the great accomplishments. Uh, and I feel like your history, African American history, is American history. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Miss um, uh, Charles, I mean, to uh, one, one more feather for in your hat is you're a published author too. To, <laughs> I'm an American and splintered, broke, uh, brokenness in the political arena. I must admit, I have not read the second one. But, and I think the other one is called as always sacrificing America for political gain. It will be great if you can take a couple minutes to pro, uh, pro, provide us the essence of these books. Oh, I would love to. Uh, splintered was actually written in 2014. And I am not the only author. What I did was I reached out. Uh, there were some college students, my children. Um, just I wanted it to look like America. And so they all added their own chapters in the book. But one of the chapters, believe it or not, uh, chapter 14 to be exact, is called America First, Chartering Your Course. And so when a lot of people are hearing now uh, America First, I was saying that long before a lot of other people were saying that, and that was in 2014. But what it did was, but that also led to where I'm going today and some of the things I've done, but that book, people say it was before its time because it talks about the things that are happening right here today and how those different writers wrote to what is happening right here today. I, in fact, I ask all of y'all to please get it. You can get it off my website, vivianchilds.com, as well as you can get it off Amazon, Barnes and over there, all there, but it's splinter because that's what we are now. We have become a nation of this, we divide. Everything is about some kind of American instead of just being an American. And that's why I wrote, I am an American, not black American, not Hispanic American, American. And that's, if we would live that way, I think we would, even talking about Black History Month, a Hispanic month, Every month is our month because we are American. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Ms. Charles, it's kind of funny. You said you may, you wrote those books in 2014 and mm -hmm. uh, that, those have become the popular slogans. And if you look yeah. back at it, you're like, that's common sense. It should be America first. We live here. We want to make sure we live uh, uh, happily, prosperously, and so our kids and grandkids. So yeah. you, have, you obviously had a great vision for America there. So yeah. while we, Ms. Charles, when we are talking about slogans, I, I kind of looked at your website. I've kind of known you for about a couple of years at this point. Yeah. So I felt compelled to look at your website. Uh, two things that resonated with me very well. One of them being moving forward starts with you. So when mm -hmm. I... Uh, asked our communication chair to make a flyer, I wanted to make sure that kind of resonates. That. Another one is everything we need is already in place. We have a constitution that simply need to be honored, protected, and above all, respected. I truly, truly loved those quotes. Oh, thank so, you. so very true. Tell me, I mean, what prompted you to come up with these slogans, especially the constitution one? Why is that majority of the America, I wouldn't use the word majority of America, but half of America does not seem to honor the constitution as much as we all want to honor the constitution. What's happening in America? What's happening is people are on a different climb, as I call it. You know, we used to rise together. Now everyone is in their own mindset of wanting to get to the top and not bringing thoughts forward with them. When I was teaching, so I'll go back to maybe 2007 and I had the fourth grade class and we were in the class and something happened. 
And I said, class, what I need for you to do is to look up and move forward. And we captured that and all my students would tell you, I think they probably all know that slogan, but no matter what would happen, I would just say, look up and move forward. What happened in the past is there to make sure that you don't repeat it. You need to know it, but don't try to gravitate there. I said, but if you look up and keep moving forward, there's a better life ahead of you. And so when I put that on my website, moving forward, I was talking to the people in the district in which I am running. Um, when you are electing a candidate, vet them. Make sure that everything that they are promising you that they're going to do for you, they've already done. And you can do that by looking at their history. See, history again. Make sure, because I can tell you I'm going to do anything, but how do you know I can or I will if I've not done it? So everything I ask someone, tell them I'm going to do, I've already done it. I don't have to go to a computer and look it up. I can just look in my life and I can tell you, this is the consequences and these are the challenges and these will be the results because I know. Them. Wow. So that's wow. how it is going. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. I, I am glad you're an educator. I can see you're obviously a minister. <laughs> uh, I said reverend minister, but I'm glad you're an educator because as you brought up twice, history is so very important. And I think as an immigrant, I, I enjoy learning more about history. I feel that's kind of the foundation of my values and principles. So, uh, thank you for sharing that with your students. I'm sure you brought uh, quite a bit of knowledge into them. Uh, yes, and, and you know, and you asked me about the Constitution as well. So let me just say, when it comes to the Constitution, that's something we learn. You know, that has been our blueprint here in America of what to do and how to treat others, and and again, consequences of those things. What is bothering me now about what is happening in America is we have elected officials who swore that they would uphold the Constitution, and they're not doing that. So what are the consequences for not fulfilling what you swore to do? I ask the constituents and everyone around me and everyone who's listening, hold your elected officials accountable, especially those who are serving right now in Congress and in the Senate, because they swore and they knew what the constitution said prior to accepting that office and they should be held accountable if they're not doing that. And they are not doing that. Absolutely. <laughs> so very true. So very true. Miss um, Charles, I think you were saying that you are running for Georgia's second congressional district, right? I think you brought that up. That very is clear. correct. So uh, I know that this is your second time running for, is that the same district? That, that is the same district, district yes. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues truly intrigued me, and I'll tell you uh, why it intrigued me when I looked at your um, uh, the issues that you're kind of uh, working on. One is a farming community. Although we live in Northern Virginia and this might not be very applicable. Uh, however, as you know, we um, we won our statewide elections and our <laughs> go uh, governor, Mr. Yankin, had farmers for Yankin yeah. coalition. And it was a very active group. And um, I, I, I personally can tell you that um, I don't have as much understanding about our farming communities in the uh, in the United States, even though I come from an agriculture family back home in India. Uh, and also, I think one thing that you eloquently said on your website is there is lack of understanding of the vitalness of our farming communities. And I think that is true, especially in Northern Virginia, where the focus is all on federal jobs, federal health care, and so on and so forth. Can you just elaborate what made you pick that as an issue? Is that Georgia's issue? Is that American issue? Everybody should know what's going on with farming community. What is it about that issue particularly? Let me just, there's been a few things that have happened um, with our farmers. And I know we all love to eat. I know I do, and I won't I fresh fruit and vegetables. So we need to make sure that the men and women and children who are taking care of those things for us are respected. And we should make things difficult for them. We should make them easier for them for us to have the food supply that we need. I get, became involved again with farmers. It seemed like everything happened in 2014. And I met a farmer and he lives right here in Georgia. And his name is Eddie Slaughter. I give his name and a shout out to him. And when I met him, he would tell you he had just about given up on the system. Uh, he was one of the farmers that was a part of a, a lawsuit um, 
where they were promised that they would have a hearing. They won, but they didn't win. It's a whole lot of things going on. But it intrigued me. And even in that book, Splintered, I mentioned that people need to just check out and see what is happening. Things happen where when we have said, why is things late? Why are our watermelons not ready? It is important that in the decisions we make about farming, we need to have farmers at the table. Nobody can tell their story better than them. And sometimes we miss the boat. And I'm saying the same thing about healthcare. If I want a decision about my health, I need to talk to a physician or someone in that field. Why would we, and I say this often enough, if I want something to be taken care of with my heart, why would I go to a mechanic? Just if it were my oil change, I wouldn't go to a medical doctor. So the same thing holds true for farmers. There are a lot of things that we could do better in America and we are not doing, but we will. That's why I'm telling everyone, vote for people like me who really have an interest in this country and the well-being of it. So Ms. Childs, just like the way you spoke about um, uh, America first, right in 2014, I'll tell you something that you need to emphasize. I was listening to your videos. You're a minister, you're very inspirational. So I do listen to you quite often. One of the, yeah. one of the statement you made is, everybody talks about pro-family, pro-law and order, which is all absolutely genuine issues. And we as Republicans need to be concerned about as conservatives. Mm -hmm. But one thing that you said that resonated very well is you said pro you. Yes. Uh, you said if uh, people vote you, vote for you, you're going to be pro you. I think that yeah. that was uh, I'm telling you that was that just li literally blew my mind away. <laughs> I said that that that's a very tiny word, but it makes uh, mm -hmm. so much sense regardless of the party that you represent. Uh, you are definitely going to work for people. I hope more people in Georgia listen to this and decide mm -hmm. to kind of vote for you. Uh, so it, Ms. Thank you for mentioning that. May I share this? Um, yeah. Based on what you just said, I was in the last election, as you well know. Um, I won day of voting. I won early voting, but I did not win on absentee balloting. Many people who does not come out of an election victorious, they're done. You don't see them anymore. You don't hear from them anymore. I continue whatever I've started continually. I do not stop because of an election because that's not where I'm running. I am actually running, not for me. And people always say, well, you run against so-and-so or you run for so-and-so seat. Not really. That seat belongs to the people. So yes, I'm running, but I need for them to hire me to work for them. So yes, I'm pro our constituents in America because sometimes we're forgotten after the election cycle. Absolutely. And also, I think what demotivates the volunteer, I hope more candidates that listen to this kind of understand and comprehend this concept. The minute candidates disappear once the elections are done, there is a very good chance that they demotivate the volunteers and people that are active in the party, because then it feels that they ran for themselves. They didn't run for the party. They didn't run for the people that they wanted to serve. So I, I, uh, I beg candidates that uh, are done with their candidacy and for any reason didn't win to be engaged because the people did not hire you this time, but the more you work for the people, the people will hire you next time because at the end of the day, we all want good governance regardless of the party structure. I hope more uh, uh, folks are like you and keep it going, move forward, moving <laughs> forward it starts with all of us. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Miles, you played multiple roles within the Republican Party over the years. I mean, again, as I said, I can read about it for like two or three minutes straight. <laughs> but let me say you were a keynote speaker. You delivered a poem at the NFRW convention at Indy. You delivered, in fact, the first motion from the floor as a surrogate at the 2020. 12 RNC convention served as a delegate at 2016 RNC convention was a panelist at Georgia, Georgia Black Conservative Summits. The reason I want to say all of this is uh, that uh, in spite of all of these, why is there an impression in the communities that the Republican Party is not open to women of color like you or me? You know, I mean, because we are active, we do what we think uh, empowers us and benefits the benefits our people, our constituents, our communities, our families, our party. So why is that impression in the communities? What do you think is uh, we are missing? Because we don't see enough women in this party. Got Even it. though we have a National Federation of Republican Women, of which we have 64,000 members, 
people do not see enough women in this party. And especially, thank you, Black History Month, especially Black women. We need to do a better job of encouraging and supporting women when they do make a run. I know what that feels like because I've been a part of, I'm, I'm going to use the word neglect, but it's okay. The difference between me and many is I don't stop because there's a stop sign. I wait for it, look both ways, and then keep it moving. Once again, I keep moving forward in spite of what people try to do to you. And I pray that that is something that will lead and guide others to not give up their fight. I stand. I'm, I'm you know, if they say it's the end of the day, I just stand. Thank you. Uh, recently, I wrote a, uh, an op-ed about diversity in GOP, and that's one thing I said. I said, I don't stop, and I continue to go regardless of how, how we are treated. However, mm -hmm. not many people would do that. So it's very important that we recognize and uh, we kind of embrace. We, we are kind of on the same wavelength here. I'm noticing. <laughs> I notice that. So uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Childs, you also sang the national anthem for, uh, you also sing the national anthem for political and community events. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's excellent. You are an educator. You served as a principal. Uh, you, I mean, it's my understanding through your business, you provided met tutoring, mentoring, and GED prep as well. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one thing that uh, fascinates me that I would want you to kind of expand on is you host this annual It's Time Unity Conference, Power Women United Luncheon, where you honor women in different career fields and also the present prestigious award. How did that get started? I mean, is that for minority women or is that for just women that are entrepreneurs? Uh, it is for women. When I started, I left um, in 2009. I was in my classroom and I thought, all right, Lord, what is it that you have for me to do? I had I was principal of this school at the time. And I thought, what's my next step? And when I looked at some of my students and they were aspiring to do all these great things, I prayed that night. And when I went back to school, I said, this is my last year of teaching. And I started the business and it was it's VL Child slash UICF. UICF stands for United in Christ Forever. Wow. And from that, I started having, um, it was called the It's Time Unity Conference. That's how we started back in 2009. And the first year I honored first ladies. And it was uh, ministers, wives, or if you were the inner sort of first ladies. And then we honored women in business, women in education. And what was unique about what we did, uh, there was a process that you, you know, that you fill out and people could nominate people. But the year that we did education, we honored principals, we honored secretaries. Some of the women who were honored was bus drivers, Excellent. parents. Yeah. I wanted women to know it doesn't matter what aspect of the job you're in. If you're doing it well, you should be recognized. Just as I told my kids when they were growing up, I don't care what it is you choose to be, but you need to choose to be the best at whatever that is. If it's basket weaving, just be the best at basket weaving. And so we did honor, and we, for those women, they received uh, certificates from senators. Uh, the first lady of the state of Georgia came down doing the education um, aspect of that, and she awarded the awards uh, to the women. Some of them, that was the first time they had seen the governor's wife. Wow. From there, mm -hmm. we decided to call it Power Women United. And I opened it up to the whole United States of America. So I have honored women like Dr. Aveda King, Keiko James out of the Heritage, you name it. Women that were um, like on the TV, uh, you name it. One well, woman is a great hairdresser. She has her own um, line of, of cosmetics for your hair and everything. She was honored. We've done Black, White, Hispanic, Indian, you name it. Those women have been honored. And I am just thrilled that you asked me about that because we have youth that would actually serve, that they would be in. So they were like little mentees. So some of the women would take some of the young women that were in high school and they mentored them for a year. 
And mm -hmm. actually my granddaughter was a recipient of being one of the mentees. And let me just tell you right now, she's aspiring right now in college. And she can always look back on that day that I had a woman of substance besides my wow. mother and my grandmother that looked over me for a year. So that, that, is, that is excellent, uh, Miss Child. So I'm not here to do any recommendation for Miss Miss Winsome Sears, as you know, she doesn't need my recommendation. No. <laughs> but you should definitely consider bringing her on. She has done magic in this uh, state, and uh, she's not only won, but she's won the hearts of all of us. Oh, including me. I love her. Yes. I love her. I love her authenticity. I love everything about her. She's yeah. very authentic, very real, very core to the values. She sees it as she, uh, as she says it, as she sees it. And uh, we are just enjoying her leadership. So yeah. next time you do it, you should consider awarding her. <laughs> so now, uh, yeah. uh, Ms. Chad, I mean, you are a teacher, you are an athletic director, you are a tight principal. Uh, tell us, what's your outlook on our current educational state in our country? Do you think our kids, regardless of race, are they set up uh, for success to compete in this fast-paced global economy? What, what is your uh, take on the educational system? It's sad to say, and that's why I think school choice is so important because depending on what school you're in, it's the type of education that you receive. That's the, that's the best way I can put it. Um, and I'm all about school choice. I think every child should be afforded the, the opportunity to have the best education that we can offer in the United States. Realistically, that does not happen all the time. So to me, our goal should make sure that every school is adequate. My dream is for every child when they wake up in the morning, they get out of bed and go, mom, we're ready. That whatever school that they're being driven to or bus to or however they're getting there is their school of choice. I don't want them to ever feel any lack because a school across the corner or around the corner even is better than the school they're attending. So it should be our goal through the school boards. And I'm telling you, teachers get beat up sometimes. We have fine teachers in these United States of America, but they need to be respected also and allowed to teach instead of doing some of the other stuff. There again, with regulations and all this, that, and the other, just do the job that they have been taught to do and that's be the best teacher that they can be. Ms. Childs, I, I'm a healthcare professional. I say this uh, very often. I am, I'm yet to see one bad clinician in my career. <laughs> and, uh, I say the same thing about teachers. I'm yet to come across one bad teacher. I don't think there is a bad teacher out there. I think it is the administrative burden, the time crunch, the regulations, the extra stuff they're required to teach kind of uh, dilutes the educational system and does not let them do their real job of uh, academic uh, focus. Uh, it's not because they're bad teachers whatsoever. So I think school choice, I mean, school choice increases competitiveness. And I think that's yeah. the way to go. Uh, they should never be tied to zip code by any means. <laughs> So, uh, Ms. Charles, this may be a little sensitive, but I want you to anyway answer. I mean, it, it, there are currently 127 women serving in Congress, and please don't quote me on these numbers. I think I'm right, but I might not be. 105 are Democrats and only 22 are Republican women serving. Among them are even out of 105 uh, Democrats, I think 47 Democrats are women of color but only one woman of color in Congress is a Republican. Again, please don't quote me on numbers. I know numbers are low, but I'm just not sure if these are the right numbers. I think they are. Um, I think the one black Republican woman that held a seat in Congress, Mia Love, Ms. Love yes. represented Utah's okay. congressional district, the way in 2015 to 2019. Uh, uh, do you think it's, uh, I don't think it's because black Republican women don't run. I think they do. So why do you think we uh, Black Republican women are not uh, uh, winning as Republicans? What's going on there? That is what I was um, talking about even earlier. Last year, I want to say there were about 13 or more. There's quite a few running this term as well. Again, they say we, you're looking for good candidates. We don't have just good candidates. We have great candidates. I'm not bragging on myself. I know I'm a good candidate, but do we get the support that we need to move forward? Absolutely not. I'm not sure if, if all women, but I can sure tell you that black women 
or not sought after to take it to the next level. And it is shameful in our Republican Party that we can only look at Mia Love as our only black woman to sit in a congressional seat because it does give the impression that we do not have qualified women. We have more than qualified women. But the way our, I'll say, because I say it out loud anyway, the way the system is set up, it does not make it easy for us to get funding. It does not make it easy for us to get through primaries. Primaries is the worst thing that ever happened to me as a candidate. We can see, we can see the next level. We can see what would happen if we got to the general against some of the people that are in those seats, the incumbents. But we can't get through the primaries. And I'm gonna say sometimes I think it's intentional. It's on purpose. But whatever it is, it's a detriment to our Republican Party. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, Ms. Charles. I think um, I'm going to expand this to more of minority candidates. And uh, obviously, that encompasses our Black women as well. I think primaries are the biggest uh, place where we get hurt, right? Uh, <laughs> we have an expansive network of democratic organization built over the last few decades, not yesterday and like Republican party to support these uh, female candidates. And But where there are only few Republican groups that are specifically working towards boosting the campaigns of Republican women, especially for minorities. And I also think minority candidates are that I ran once, uh, although I think I ran a very uh, sprint race, which was like three months. I think one thing that struck me is that the opposition, even in the primaries, that overwhelmingly outspend during primaries, mm -hmm. that have access to networks and war chests and all this wealth and power. Whereas I think minority candidates or immigrant candidates like me may not have that network and war chests of wealth and power because I was not born here. I didn't do my undergrad here. So there was no network and so on and so forth. I think we have a lot of uh, barriers to get through. But um, uh, Ms. Charles, I hope you're aware of an organization called ViewPack. Um, if you're not, I mean, they're one of those few Republican organizations that specifically work to boost GOP candidates during the primary. And they also, um, uh, they also provide a lot of re resources to minority candidates. I'm not sure if you know about that, but that may be something that um, as minority candidate, women candidates, we need to look into that. Well, I will share with you, and let me, I want to make it clear to everyone who's listening. I'm not asking anyone to give us anything. Just make sure that we are on an equal playing field. Exactly. That is all I'm asking. I'm not asking because sometimes people get it twisted when they when they hear us speak. Uh, even in my poem, I tell you quick, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. But open up those doors and I'll show you that I can get it myself. Uh, but I will share with you that I was recently endorsed by Maggie's List. Excellent. Uh, so, yes. So that's one thing that just happened recently. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good organization to endorse. Going back to ViewPAC, I, I, I'm not here to support the PAC by any means, but I know that they endorsed and supported about 27 non-incumbent Republican women in competitive races. So it's not like they're going after only incumbent women, uh, but yeah. uh, that seems to be by far one of the organization that I felt like they're truly sorting after awesome. uh, good women that they feel like they can win. So as you know, Vincent has broke all the barriers. I thought it was possible. <laughs> yes. She's, so what yes. do you think we can do to turn this around? I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, talked about primaries. I spoke about the wealth and power uh, because then what can you do when to kind of get through this hurdle? What, what can we do to get through the hurdle and win? Well, this is what, I, what I'm seeing is instead of people looking at a candidate's character, their qualifications, their ability to take you forward to the next level, because people in these districts deserve better. We have it where now is what they look at is the dollar amount that a candidate can raise. And that's shameful. All the money in the world does not make a great candidate, doesn't make that person gonna care anything about you when that election is over. Oftentimes, they may not even get through the election. 
but they have been set on a pedestal based on the amount of money that they can make. And so that's where I think a lot of the problem is, if, the, if you don't have money, then to some people you're not viable and that's shameful. So if you have to have a thinking, thinking process that money does not get you the votes, uh, money will obviously get you um, to market your campaign, but market doesn't really win the hearts by any means. I mean, I know that I can talk about statewide races, but mm -hmm. Winsome Sears were definitely not on the top of a money game. I think mm -hmm. she did her best, but I wouldn't think uh, she definitely raised nothing like the Argana candidate. She still broke the barriers. So hopefully this is a good trend. Yes. <laughs> Encourage. So, that's very encouraging. Yeah. Ms. Charles, let me stick to that. I don't want to us to get deviated because this is such a great uh, topic for us to kind of talk because there are a lot of minority candidates that listen to this uh, as well. And our goal is to actually reach out to immigrant and minority candidates through conversations that count. Um, I also hear from these minority candidates, since I'm always talking to these uh, candidates, that they lost because they didn't get the support from their own community. Let's say if I'm an Indian American, I run. Uh, and if I don't get support from my community, that's saddening, right? And I think that's because the minority communities expect them to distance themselves from the national party. Uh, but by doing that, you'll never get support from your own party. <laughs> so this applies to ability to raise funds, as you just said. So I think we are always in this vicious cycle that you don't get it because they don't. Uh, they all support minority and immigrant com so communities support Democrats more. We are, which we are um, hoping to kind of pierce into that market. Let me put it that way by actually talking to them about our values because yes, our values are very well aligned. But how do you get out of this vicious cycle? What can we do to change? What I have done and what I continue to do and will continue to do, God willing, is. I spend a lot of time in the community. I spend a lot of time actually talking to the people whose vote I'm asking for. And I just don't say it out loud. I'm actually doing, in fact, some of the best times of my life is when I have been at maybe like a back to school bash where I'm giving out backpacks and hot dogs to children. And they happen to notice that I vote Republican. In fact, it was so cute. One little boy one day, he said, mom, She's a Republican as though, you know, <laughs> and I said, son, I said, I'm a Christian who votes Republican. Yes. And he asked for one of our church, our local uh, GOP party actually was helping donate that day for that event. And he wanted one of our t-shirts and his mother looked at us and I said, you know, she said, absolutely. And he sat there and he put it on and he walked away. Those are the kind of things to me that message better than anything because he saw us as who we are. People in the community just wanting a better tomorrow for those that are in the community. That's how I live my life. I'm a giver. I tell some people, I say, you know, I'm a pusher. They went, ooh, Miss Chaz, you a pusher? I say, yes, I push love. I push integrity. Mm -hmm. I push education. And so, but they first know me as, a lot of people call me Miss V, as Miss V. Then, on voting day, I become the Republican today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's uh, when you just brought a smile to my face. I think that's a beautiful example. And I'm sure many kids uh, feel the same way when the, once they come to know that we are Republicans. They're like, you're a Republican? <laughs> I get the same <laughs> I get the same expression. So uh, Ms. Charles, I wanna also hit on the mainstream um, issues that we are worried about, right? pro-life, uh, I mean, pro-law enforcement and so on and so forth. What is happening with all these issues? I mean, I know the issues are not my state issues or your state issues, they're our country issues. What's your take on that? I mean, why, why do you think Democrats are going so liberal that everything is considered to be woke, wokeness? Why do they prioritize wokeness? What's happening with our law enforcement, pro-life issues and so on and so forth? You know, I think there is an agenda of dependency that is happening. And so if you take away things that are comfortable for people, then they need to depend on you for things. When it comes to law enforcement, I, I said this to a group that I was um, mentoring and I said, they said, well, we don't like the popo. That's what they were calling them. And I said, why? They said, well, they do bad things. 
And I said, so let me ask you this. If something was happening right near in your home and you needed help, who would you call? They said, we called the Papa. I said, would you want them to come? They said, yes. I said, but why? It, because then they would help us. I said, keep that mentality. They're there to protect. Are there some times when they do things that's not right? Absolutely. Just as people in the pulpit sometimes do things that are not right. And they're supposed to be godly. I said, but don't judge the masses over a couple of bad apples. And in fact, yearly until the pandemic hit, I, on 9-11, I host uh, what we call the 9-11 event, Patriots Day, where we honor the uh, law enforcement and the firemen and the military people, just an hour celebration, but just to let them know that we care and we thank them for what they did during 9-11 and what they continue to do. Again, I don't know what we would do if we defund police or defund the military, defund anyone whose purpose it is and their mission is to protect. We need all the protection we can get. Absolutely. Miss Childs, I, I always start coming from an Indian background. I was, I was there for two decades. I'm here for two decades. I feel that law enforcement is something that I strongly, strongly believe that we can never defund because that's what happens in uh, several third world countries when uh, police, uh, do, uh, uh, police are not funded well, they're not educated well, a lot of atrocities happen. And this is one country where we fund them decently. We want to make sure they follow the policies, but because of one bad apple, we can continue to demean the entire law enforcement. Uh, um, Ms. Charles, as you know, I, I, I do a lot of minority engagement. In fact, before this, uh, we had a nice engagement meeting where we had an Ethiopian American come in uh, and um, Hispanic American. So we had a nice meeting to kind of strategize and see how we need to get to these uh, groups because our values, again, are one and the same. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. So I know you play a huge role in National Federation of Republican Women as a diversity director. Um, I, I hope you're still in that role because I can't find a better person than you <laughs> to hold on to that leadership role. But does your role uh, involve any gr uh, grassroots diverse group engagement or is it more policy focused? What's the role that you play there? Our role was, and my term did end in December, we have uh, the new president and, and their team are abound as I call it. But I still keep in touch with the, the women that was on the team. Our goal, was to be able to be a mouthpiece if needed. And just wisdom, uh, as some people would tell me, we don't know how to engage your community. Can you assist us in that? And we were there to do that. Um, the media, we were there to help with that. One of the uh, women on our team actually was a publicist for a, a station. But she knew when it came to policies and what to do with media, she was outstanding. We had women that were keynote speakers across this country and they're still speaking. We had some of the best groomed women who were Republican mm -hmm. on that diversity. In fact, in, um, I, I, I wanna call her name, Patty. I, do you, I don't know if you know Patty now, she's from Virginia, Loudoun right. County. Uh -huh. Yes. Awesome, not just good, this was an awesome woman. And so, and what we tried to do also was make sure that our committee was as diverse as the communities we were trying to reach. And we did that. Excellent. Uh, so who did you say is the diversity director right now uh, for NFRW, Ms. Charles? I am not sure. Okay, okay. So but, we, can, um, uh, we can go to their website, uh, okay. National Federation, and it will be there. Thank you. Ms. Charles, is this the um, same as faith coalitions as well? Is there an outreach program on behalf of National Federation of Republican Women or Georgia GOP to reach out to other faiths as well? Because in minority and immigrant groups, uh, just like in, in our Christian communities, uh, faith is very important to them. That's where we align so much other than our pro-life and the pro-schools, pro-school pro choice, pro-law enforcement. It's just the faith, family, and freedom also are very valuable, uh, valuable thing for immigrant and minority communities. So is there a faith coalition that um, works with other faith coalitions or? Yeah, 
there are several. In fact, there are many people that was with the Trump uh, campaign and with that administration that actually even still have a faith advisory. Paula White, again, I mentioned Dr. Avita King and several of those. And then we also have the Frederick Douglass uh, Coalition and they do a lot. They have prayer groups. They have all sorts of meaningful things. I, I have to give uh, Dr. Dean Nelson his, his kudos. He's an awesome man of God. He's a, he's a great speaker. In fact, he spoke at an event last night here in Georgia that was outstanding, I'm told. Um, I was here, so I missed that one, but I hear it was excellent. I'm sure if he was a part of it, it was. But it's those type of things. In fact, I even had a prayer group prior to even being with the diversity um, that called the Nation Praise. In fact, the lady called me today and said, will you please restart that prayer group? We would have, uh, my call would take a thousand calls. People couldn't get on. So that tells me that this nation is crying out for prayer. Uh, they're not happy with the way it is going. There are many that are responsible, but that is why it's important that we choose the right people to lead and guide this country. Absolutely. And uh, Ms. Charles, uh, I am a Hindu faith community, uh, community personnel. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, for me, faith is very important. To, um, yes. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's precisely why I'm very focused on interfaith and multi-faith uh, community. Mm -hmm. I think the more we, we work with Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Jains, I can go on and on, um, our Jewish friends and so on and so forth. I think the more we can expand our tent because at the end of the day, we all want strong economy. We all want yes. entrepreneurs. We don't want to depend on government. I never want to put out my hand for anything. I want to work very hard. I want uh, everybody to be treated equally. And these are just core Republican principles. Uh, there's really nothing uh, bad about it. It's all America first, and it only helps us grow yeah. as, as a complete American family. Why do so you think we're here? That's why we're in America. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's one of the other things that I did. Um, can't remember the year, but a few years back, I made sure that I looked out to get someone of different faith. And we met at the Capitol all together. I sent you a picture of it so you can see it. Um, we met at the Capitol and we all prayed together. Each one of those ministers, the rabbi, whatever, they all got up and they spoke to the crowd. And what was beautiful about it is they were, everybody was welcome. That's what the America that I know. That's how we do it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Charles, I know I hate to put you on the spot. I know that during NFRW recited something. It would be great if you can take a 30 seconds or a minute to recite something. I know you did that during NFRW and it was the most peaceful thing I've heard. I don't know if you recollect that at all. If uh, if not, no worries. I hate to put you on the spot. Oh, that's I, fine. Are you the, talking about I am an American? Exactly. Is that yes, what it was you were talking yes. about? Yes. In fact, I'll give you a little bit of it. it. It won't be the whole thing. And people, you can go and get my book and you can hear the whole thing. But it goes, I am an American. The Constitution is my source of strength. It has equipped us with the words necessary to lead and guide this country. I am an American. I was born in this great country, raised by parents who loved me, taught by educators who mentored me and protected by the forces who protected me. I am not a visitor of this land and I am here to lend a hand because I am an American. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Miss Childs, I mean, you are such a, you just literally brought us. <laughs> that, was, that was, I mean, I heard that and literally I had tears the first time I heard that. I think it just resonates with all us as, uh, uh, as patriots. So Miss Childs, as we are getting close to the end of the show, I would like you to take a minute or two and let the audience know if I missed asking you anything crucial. If you feel like, uh, hey, Shri, I'm on the show for like an hour. You, you really didn't hit the main issue that I really wanted to talk about. This is your time. So anything that you uh, want to talk to the audience, in fact, you can take the time to give your website since you're running. Uh, okay, tell you. us how to support you as a volunteer, donations, whatever you would like to say in the last few minutes. I appreciate that. Actually, uh, and my website is vivianchiles.com. 
I kept it simple. And this is what you can do. So many people will tell you, I'm not in your district. Well, let me just share this with you. Technically you are, because when I'm hired and I'm elected and I'm in Congress, every vote that I make is gonna affect each and every one of you. I'm gonna be your voice. So you make sure that you put people there like me that you can trust with your vote. And I said, if that wasn't important, we wouldn't be worried about the people that we're talking about just making these decisions where we have to raise our eyebrows and go, oh Lord, not this time again. So make sure that the people that we are putting forward, stop looking at age, stop looking at who their best friends are. You vet your own candidate and get push them forward. Um, so this is what you can do. I receive every donation and everyone is, is equal to me as the other. $5 from someone who made 10 is almost unexpected. A thousand is fantastic. $2 is good. But you know what is even best? Every one of y'all probably have a Twitter account or a Facebook account. Go to your accounts and say, wherever you are, support Vivian Chow. Absolutely. Just put that on your pages. You can put it on there daily or uh, ask, who is Vivian Childs? How do we get to know her better? Please, if you, you can do that without any cost at all, with just a little bit of your time. I take your time. <laughs> Ms. Charles, that, that is a, what a way to kind of end the show. You know, thank you. You're absolutely right. Regardless of which district you are running from, once you're in Congress, you're representing America and you're representing yeah. American values. You're representing my children. You're representing all of our grandchildren. So we need you. We need passionate patriots like you out there. And I thank you so much for your willingness to participate in conversations that count. Um, I know this is my third uh, interactions this close to you. Every single time <laughs> I walk away, learning more about you. Whatever I'm learning, I'm loving it. Let me put it that way. <laughs> So you are an amazing, strong woman, a patriot and an inspirational and transformational leader. I think one thing that I can relate to you is regardless of what happens, how many failures you have, you just get up next day and start walking. You moving Amen. forward to say. So keep up the phenomenal work. We need more of you, in not only Georgia, but we need more of you in our communities. This time I'm 100% positive you will make it. But if not, uh, hey, you are, uh, you're going to be in our hearts and minds. Uh, and I know you'll continue to keep doing great work. So uh, viewers, as we continue to honor our black community leaders during Black History Month, I will have Mr. Terry Todd, Program Manager of Civil Society and the American Dialogue from Heritage Foundation with us on Friday, February 25th at 6 p.m. And I also will have Ms. Mary Melvin on Saturday, February 26th at 6 p.m. Ms. Milburn, among her many distinguished accomplishments, she also sang for 43rd, 44th, and 45th U.S. presidents and for the 80th anniversary and commemoration of Pearl Harbor. So it will be great for you to continue to support conversations that count so we can bring not only the future leaders that I just talked to you about, but we leaders such as Ms. Vivian Childs into this program. And I hope you continue to support not only our community leaders, but Fairfax Republican Committee as well. Thank you for listening. God bless you all and God bless America.